Well, good morning, everybody. Here we have another weekend. I hope you've got nice, some exciting plans. Uh, hope you had a good week. Stay away from the COVID thing. Wear your mask. All that good stuff. Social distancing. Uh, you'll probably notice that I've made some minor changes to my channel. I'm trying to see if I can get a little more attention from YouTube in their search algorithms. So let me know if this causes you any problem in the comments and uh, I'll fix it. So in this video, I know you'll be excited. We offer some silly globe questions from Nathan Oakley and show him the answers. He thinks there's no answer. As always, I will leave you with URLs and video links for detailed information. So I want you to be sure and stay until the end. You will be laughing at the reasons Nathan gives for believing Flat Earth. This will be a new soundbite for 2021. So, without delay, let's jump right into the first question. So, distance to the sun. The first attempt to measure the distance to the sun was by Aristarchus in about uh, 250 BC, which was around the time that Aristosthenes was there. He observed that the sun, the moon, and he deduced that when the moon is at half full, so you guys have all seen that, the sun, earth, and moon must be the vertices of a right triangle. So he took the distance to the moon to be one unit, just whatever it is, one. And then he measured the angle between the moon and the sun using simple trigonometry. So he looked up with his bare eyes and... Uh, measured that angle. Uh, so with all of this, he found the distance to the sun to be 19 times farther than the moon. So there are many reasons for his inaccuracies, using bare eyes, you know, whatever. Uh, remember, this is 250 BC, so uh, there was a lot of inaccuracy there. In uh, 1653, Christian, Christian Huygens used the planet Venus and made a similar calculation and was very accurate in his uh, prediction of what the distance to the sun was. In 1672, Giovanni Cassini uh, used parallax. Uh, he got a friend of his from, on a different part of the earth and uh, measured uh, the angle. Uh, and so he was able to do even more accurate because he was using more scientific methods. So he's usually given the credit for determining the distance. These are all before the heliocentric model was even pr uh, proposed. Uh, again, you know, uh, the heliocentric model came later. Uh, currently, the distance can be measured much more accurately uh, than using uh, geometric methods. Uh, it can be done by all kinds of collaborative methods. Uh, 
uh, many different scientists have measured this distance. Uh, it's quite uh, common. Uh, the distance to the sun is used in a lot of calculations uh, for satellites, uh, for uh, solar system dynamics, uh, orbits of the other planets, and so forth. So uh, that tells us that uh, the distance sun has been very accurately calculated and uh, Nathan is up creek with this one. Well, here we go. Nathan, and of course all flat earthers, deny that the earth rotates. I have myself, me, taken some data from timeanddate.com. I used several different cities and I tried to get them as close to uh, east-west from each other as I could uh, and then several different ones of these. Uh, the data I used is sunrise times for each day and the distance between the westernmost city to the easternmost city and divided that by the sunrise time difference gives me the miles per hour that the sun is moving across whatever the appropriate latitude is. Of course now if the earth were flat those times should all be the same. Uh, the sun is moving, uh, you know, sunrise, the termination line should all move about the same time. However, on a globe, <coughs> these times are going to vary. As we all know, we've heard flat earthers tell us this a million times. Uh, 1,037 miles per hour at the equator. Uh, so that's the fastest. And then it gets diminishes. It gets lower as your latitude moves away from the equator, both north and south. This is exactly what it did in my experiment. Uh, and they were exactly the speeds that we would have expected um, a sphere to turn uh, at 15 degrees per hour. Thank you, Bob. Uh, so that's this one. That was easy. Let's see what his next one is. Oh, boy. This one's going to be fun. When I first started college, believe it or not, I wanted to be a geologist. And I worked for a geology lab, uh, which happened to be directly downstairs from a seismic laboratory. Uh, and they had this shaking table. It was a big, heavy table. Uh, like made out of granite or something, uh, probably weighed three or four hundred pounds. And, you know, they had motors that would shake it like an earthquake. And they used that to test what an earthquake does using a very controlled environment. So they could control the uh, the how massive the earthquake was, how long the earthquake was, whether it was kind of a rolling earthquake or a shake, uh, they could do all of that. So they knew by testing all of the things that go into or that come out of when an earthquake happens. Uh, so an earthquake produces S waves, P waves, and surface waves. Those are the three main waves. 
So waves, surface waves, travel along the surface of the Earth. Uh, they can be measured and, and tracked. Um, P waves are compression waves, so they're kind of like uh, sound waves, and they will travel through any medium, solids, gas, liquids, whatever. Those are the P waves. P stands for primary, and then S waves, S stands for secondary, uh, S waves travel like light waves. They have these ups and downs, the uh, amplitude and whatever. And uh, so S waves travel like light waves and they cannot travel through liquids. So anything that is a liquid medium, the S waves will be reflected off of. So um, this is postulated and tested in the laboratory. They can test with liquids and uh, different types of liquids. And so they, they have a well-known, uh, well-tested uh, postulate. And then they can go back into the field uh, with uh, when it, when there are earthquakes that happen, and they can test these in the real world, in reality, uh, using equipment that ch that measures these uh, different types of waves. And in fact, you know, they build these seismic stations. Um, and if you've ever seen the paper that comes out and has the little squiggles on it, those, those are the seismic stations that are recording the different wave types uh, for some earthquake. Uh, these seismic stations don't have to be manned, and they have them set up all across the earth, uh, in every country and everywhere, including Antarctica. There are seismic stations there. I visited seismic stations back when I thought I was a geologist. And um, so I understand the methods that go into uh, testing each of these earthquakes. Uh, I can definitely tell you that our earthquakes travel through the earth and surface waves go around the earth. They can be monitored by many of these stations. So you get a picture of when the waves go through the earth, uh, when the surface waves go around. So they get a picture of, you know, the, how massive the earthquake was, uh, the location. They can uh, triangulate and get the location of the earthquake and uh, so it's very um, it's very well measured very um, exact they measure you know they can tell when uh, at the when the s waves go through the earth there's a point where they're reflected back that reflection is because of some liquid. The S waves cannot travel through liquids. So there has to be something molten in the center of the Earth down there. And that's where we have found that it's molten metal based on temperatures, pressures. Uh, you can figure out that it's uh, iron and nickel. So there is a molten metal in the center of the earth. There's no question. It's measured every day um, from thousands of these seismic stations across the earth. So this one was an easy one, I think. So we're on roll now. Here we go to number four. Okay, so 
Number four, gravity. I know you're all excited about this. This is the biggest flat earth lie. <laughs> the denial <coughs> of gravity. They do not have any proof of the absence of gravity. Uh, they do not have anything that can replace gravity. Uh, this is their biggest claim to refuting the spherical earth. However, they have decided that the burden of proof fallacy, the burden of proof, is on the scientists. Now, I don't know how we can have the status quo is gravity causes things to fall to the floor. That's the status quo. They make a claim that there is no such thing as gravity. They should have the burden of proof. They can't tell me that there's no gravity and then make me have to prove it. Uh, that's just the biggest fallacy you can imagine. Uh, of course, they have this huge triumph. Uh, Sleeping Warrior does this all the time, uh, where he says that uh, uh, the advanced theoretical physicists are in disagreement about where gravity comes from. Uh, and they have all these theories and all of these explanations. And so to a flat earther, it means that gravity is fake or gravity is not a force. And we've heard that a lot. These physicists do say that, that gravity is not a force but they're talking about in the universe-wide picture. Now, for you flat earthers, you don't, don't even believe in the universe, so you shouldn't be talking about those things uh, that have to do with the universe. Uh, Sleeping Warrior likes to say, Einstein totally refuted and replaced Newton with relativity. And that's not true. As far as in our solar system, uh, Newtonian gravity works. Gravity is a force. And everything works as expected. Um, the acceleration due to gravity is used every day in hundreds of applications. Uh, all over technology, they use uh, the acceleration of gravity. And uh, <laughs> in aerospace, in uh, uh, just everything. So if you're, if you're going to throw out gravity, then there are going to be tons of things that no longer work. Uh, so here's a good example that I want flat earthers to try to explain with buoyancy. Inside your ear, there are little hairs and fluid. Uh, and the way they respond is what makes you dizzy or not dizzy if they're moving or, you know, that's where, that's how you keep your balance. And so, uh, what do you suppose causes that ability to keep your balance? Okay. Wait for it. Gravity. Uh, I wish I had that clip from Desert Field, but uh, I don't. So, gravity. So, every question after this is going to be a letdown because, um, because gravity is the biggie. I don't know why... Uh, Nathan didn't include this as the first question, but anyway, we covered it. So let's see what happens in the next question. Poor old Nathan just can't handle air pressure. Of course, you'll hear this from all of Nathan's goonies and every other flat earther on YouTube. 
this is their one chance at quoting science. They can finally take a law of science and they use the second law of thermodynamics. Of course, not one of them, including Nathan, has ever actually studied the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, uh, Professor Dave on YouTube has some really good videos on thermodynamics. Uh, you might check those out. Uh, but little do these flat earthers know that this law not only disproves pressure in a container, but it proves gravity and it disproves cold moonlight. Uh, so, here we go. The second law of thermodynamics says that if a gas is released into a container, it will fill the container uh, with an equivalent pressure, equal pressure, uh, unless acted on by a force. So, the gas fills from bottom to top with the same pressure. Uh, and you can find pictures of this with Nathan's funny bouncy balls, uh, which I get irritated at. But um, the, the pressure is equalized all the way through the container unless acted on by a force. Uh, so there are several problems with their use of this law. First, the atmosphere in real life, reality, the atmosphere has a graduated pressure. It's larger at sea level, and then it gradually decreases until you get to the Kármán line, which is at about 100 kilometers or 62 miles. Uh, so that in itself... Uh, is a problem with the container because they cannot have a graduated pressure in a container. It doesn't work that way. So we have this Kármán line that pressure decreases until it's almost zero at the Kármán line. Nathan always says 10 to the minus 17 tor. It's a vacuum. And um, um, so, the atmosphere is decreasing all the way up until it gets to zero. So, it's not the 14 psi next to the vacuum. It's zero psi, or 10 to the minus 17 tor, next to uh, the vacuum. Uh, so, you... Let's, let's ask a flat earther the next time you're uh, conversing with someone. Ask them, how high is the dome or the membrane, if they want to call it that. I think Nathan and Sleeping Warrior call it that. Um, they usually say 3,000 miles, 4,000 miles you know, somewhere in that range. So, uh, let's think for a minute here. The vacuum starts at 100 kilometers, 62 miles. The uh, dome is at 3,000 miles. So, what in the heck fills that container the rest of the way, uh, 2,038 miles? Uh, it's a vacuum right there, and the dome is higher than that. So now we have a problem here. Okay, so now we're almost done. Uh, we just have a couple more questions to go through, uh, and then we have the big uh, Laugh at Nathan part. Here is the bane of our existence, curvature. 
seems that Flat Earther just can't leave this alone. Obviously, if there is curvature, the Earth can't be flat, so I guess that's why they harp on it all the time. But you know, I find it amazing that Aristotle, Plato, every scientist and philosopher for the last 3,000 years knew that the Earth was a sphere. So, in 1849, Samuel Robotham wrote a pamphlet called Zetetic Astronomy under the pseudonym Parallax. I guess he was too embarrassed to use his real name. So, uh, little did he know that in the 21st century, a bunch of morons that avoid science in high school it was too hard uh, they never took college uh, I doubt they ever went to college for anything especially not science and here these morons are they would deny every scientific advancement since then to shout that the earth is flat And yet, Eratosthenes was able to calculate the circumference of the Earth from a stick and two shadows in uh, 222 BC. This was long after Aristotle and Plato. Um, we all knew it was a sphere. They all knew it was a sphere. So. Uh, Eratosthenes, all he was doing is calculating the circumference because they already knew it was a sphere. Um, um, I myself was able to calculate this same circumference of the Earth and I used timeanddate.com. I got 19 cities on four different days and using the measurement, their measurement of the sun's angle at high noon and the exact distance from the city to its uh, corresponding tropic line, I calculated the exact uh, circumference of the earth and my value was 2% off. Um, so, you know, there are many different ways to calculate uh, curvature. Seismic data shows curvature and circumference. Um, uh, it, it just seems like uh, flat earthers can't get away from, they take one picture, this black swan thing, and that one picture becomes their mantra somehow. Uh, it's on every single channel. Uh, everybody shows it. Everybody asks the same questions. Uh, I can guarantee you uh, that one picture does not a flat earth make. Okay? Uh, in addition to that, there, are, there have been pictures taken from space since 1946. That's long before computers, uh, and those pictures are definitely show curvature. And since then, there have been pictures taken. And today, in the 21st century, they take pictures, thousands of photos every day, uh, different agencies, the ISS, the Himawari satellite, all of these. Uh, take photos every day, uh, some of them is as much as every, one every 10 minutes, and every one of these show curvature, every single one. Uh, you cannot tell me that all of these thousands and thousands of pictures uh, 
have been CGI, especially not the one in 1946. Okay, so we've debunked curvature. Here's the last question. Okay, so like I said, this is a short one. Nathan, for some reason, is stuck on this value for R. This ought to be a reason for you to laugh every time you hear him say, what's the value for R? And um, so we've already discussed various ways that circumference can be calculated. And of course, the radius of a sphere can be easily calculated from the circumference. Just use some simple trigonometry. Just, it's really easy. Uh, and you can calculate R. So, uh, whichever method you use to calculate circumference, uh, it's easy to see what R is. And I'm sure Eratosthenes did that in BC, and it's easy to do nowadays. Uh, so, there's no reason for Nathan to be so stuck on uh, the value for R. Uh, again, there are many modern ways uh, that you can directly measure R. Uh, again, seismic calculations and all kinds of things like that. Okay, so we have answered all seven of Nathan's big questions. Uh, you can look on his website. The seven questions he says are going to appear on every video. This is his new intro. Uh, so you'll see them there. Uh, but now we come to the laughing part. So I hope you've got your uh, you're re all ready to be laughing. Make sure you clear the space around you because you might roll on the floor a little bit. Uh, this last part is from somebody that's interviewing Nathan Oakley about Flat Earth. Uh, I won't spoil the laugh for you, but I hope you get the joke. So I was essentially saying to myself, look how flat it is. But I wasn't. I was saying I wish I could go higher to see curve. So when, like okay. I say, you hear somebody not ridiculing it, it sets off a, a chain reaction of thoughts and feelings that I'd had already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear me.